Welcome to the Green Urbanist, a podcast for urbanists fighting climate change. I'm Ross. Welcome back to another episode. Today we are talking all about Camden in North London and what's going on there with the Camden High Line, the Camden Green Loop, um, and the intersection of green infrastructure, urban greening, with actually um, businesses and the vitality of small businesses. It's a really interesting discussion. It's probably not what you're expecting. Um, and it's uh, my guest today is Simon Pitkeithley. Um, I'll read out his bio. You, he's a very different kind of guest to the people I usually have on, who are usually architects and ecologists and people like that. But Simon is a business person, and he's a business person who's passionate about climate change and about good urban environments, which is a really interesting combination. Um, so Simon is CEO of the Business Improvement Districts, Camden Town Unlimited and Euston Town, as well as being CEO of Camden Collective and the Camden High Line. He is also co-chair of the Cross River Partnership and chair of Camden Giving. Simon sits on the London Enterprise Action Partnership and is its champion for small business. During the pandemic, Simon was seconded to the Mayor's COVID Business Forum and the London Transition Board, where he chaired the Business Reopening Strategy Group. He now sits on the London Recovery Board and Simon has been leading the Camden Highland Project since its inception in 2017. It's clearly a guy that has a lot going on. And our, our conversation kind of reflects that. It jumps around a lot from talking about the Camden High Line, which, as the name suggests, is um, a new public park that's being designed and built in Camden on some unused rail infrastructure, just like the New York High Line, to talking about the fourth industrial revolution um, and what that could mean in cities, to talking about why good urban design is good for business. It's, it's, it's a really interesting um, conversation um, I like that it jumps around a lot because <laughs> that's sort of how my brain works as well. If you want to see visuals of the Camden High Line, the Camden Green Loop, and these other projects that we talk about, um, you could obviously use your favorite search engine, but I'll also put some links in the episode description so you can just click there. That's it for now. Please enjoy this conversation with Simon. Okay, we're now recording. Thank you so much, Simon, for joining me on the podcast. Very good to be here. Um, you just kick off by telling us a bit about yourself, please. So my name's Simon Pitt-Keithley. I do a variety of things, including proposing things like the Camden High Line. I run a, two business improvement districts. I sit on the London LEP called LEAP, um, and I run a thing called Camden Collective. Probably other stuff too, but... <laughs> it's the compressed version, is it? Yeah. Um, brilliant. Well, we want to talk about all the things that are happening in Camden, which sounds really exciting. Um, in particular, this thing about the Camden bid, um, mm. if I'm using the right title there. You are. Um, you just tell us about what is that and what are you trying to achieve? And maybe for, for any listeners from outside the UK, what is a bid, a business improvement district? Sure. Bids began life in Canada. Uh, about 40 years ago. Uh, they're pretty big in America and they've come over here uh, 15, 16, 17 years ago, something like that. There's about 300 in the UK, uh, about 70, I think, in London now. And what it is, is it's a smallish territory, normally a commercial, normally a commercial area, and everyone in that area gets uh, an opportunity to vote on whether or not they want to be a business improvement district. And when I say everyone, sorry, I should say that's uh, people who pay business rates okay. above a certain threshold. So it's a commercial thing. It's a business improvement district. Uh, so, yeah, if you pay business rates in an area above a threshold that someone says they'd like to set up a bid in, then you get a vote. And if everyone votes in, or a majority vote in favor, then everyone has to who is eligible has to pay a 1% of their rateable value, normally 1% of mm. their rateable value um, levy, which is collected by the council in the same way as business rates. And that funds us for a five-year term, normally. Um, and then at the end of five years, we either pack up and go home or <laughs> we ask for another term. So it's a bit like being a local councillor for business, I guess. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. I was gonna, I was wondering actually about the funding, but you've explained that perfectly. Um, and I mean, we we had a chat before where you were saying most, you know, business improvement districts um, 
at least some of the poorer examples tend to do things like you know putting up window boxes and <laughs> flower boxes and things like that and you, yeah, what you're well, trying to do in camden is just like achieve a lot more with that so what what, what is your yeah ambition? i think i think i mean i i do have a, a deep innate hatred of hanging baskets and it's not <laughs> that i'm sort of anti-flowers it's just i think they kind of represent limited thinking you know and I, and I think that the reality is what you can do with a business improvement district, because you've got a team of people normally who are paid, you've got a bank account, you've got this weird democratic legitimacy, you sit in this strange public private space, you could do all sorts of things with that. I think the, the, the danger is what you end up doing is going around and asking all the local businesses what they want. And of course, they're very busy trying to keep their businesses alive, you know, particularly at the moment, and very focused on tomorrow's takings or probably this afternoon's takings. Um, and if you keep asking them what they want, they're going to say, oh, I don't know, fix the bin collections or <laughs> make that paving flat or have about some Christmas lights or, you know, that's what, and that's so you end up with hanging baskets. Whereas I think the opportunity is to present those businesses with a vision and say, this is brilliant, isn't it? Should we do this then? <laughs> and and that is just a slightly different approach and that's enabled us to do the sort of big street skate stuff that we've done the the highline the cam collective it's all kind of based around that idea of wow what could we do in this weird space and i think you know i mean i could talk more about the sort of fourth industrial revolution stuff we tried to do but that's perhaps sort of outside the scope of this podcast but you know you can kind of do what you want provided you can bring the board and the members with you okay yeah. And some of the things you are looking to do are things like the Camden High Line, which is obviously inspired by the New York High Line. Indeed. Um, and other sort of green infrastructure stuff, which to me seems very strange for something that's supposed to be, you know, focused on business. So maybe for people that seems like those are not connected. Why, why is that a focus for you? Well, it's very much connected because mostly what you want from the area in which you trade is it for it to be a great environment that people want to be. And that's true of the visitors. It's true of your staff. It's true of your clients. You know, it's true for yourself. And, and so it's not, um, I mean, it, I like to think it's, it's enlightened self-interest. So it's not yeah. pure, how do I, you know, increase my turnover tomorrow? Although, you know, you hope it will increase someone's turnover. If you open up something like the High Line in your neighborhood, it's probably going to have a positive impact on your turnover at some point. But it's also recognizing that it's you're part of a broader whole. And that's what this whole democratic legitimacy thing is about, really. You know, you can't bend this, the vehicle just to one person's whim. It's got to you've got to be able to kind of bring a majority of people with you. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, I mean, it's the kind of thing that urban designers like me have been trying to tell people for decades, which is that good urban design is good for business. Yeah. And somehow that doesn't always sink in with people. Have you, have you had trouble convincing businesses of this? Well, I think, I think when you first start a business improvement district, you, you have to get some early easy wins that people can see are going to benefit them. I'm paying you this money. What do I get out of it? That's a reasonable yeah. transaction, you know. Um, so you do definitely do need to get those early wins. But once you've got some, then you've built the trust and then you can start kind of extending the leash a bit and gradually um, be more and more imaginative. And so much of this stuff is is about lobbying politics. It's about managing mm. upwards management. It's about having a board of people that will support you in allow you to take risks, you know, not blame you for failure if what you're trying to do is in the broad, broadly the right direction. You know, it's about relationships and getting those things right. So provided you can, you, you can manage those things, most things become possible within reason. Mm. Um, and you obviously have a, um, I mean, a kind of a focus on sustainability. Would you sure. say, and what, yeah. what what's the thinking behind that? Uh, it, it's that you know we are in a, car, a, a, a climate crisis, and um, a lot of the contributing factors are related to business. Not doesn't mean business is business's fault, but they are related to. And so, some of the things that we'll need to fix are related to business. And the challenge is then to, in a sense, not get too hung up on that big picture but to focus on the small tangible, what can we do here and now? What can we as a business improvement district take on for an area that helps you as a business kind of feel like you're doing your bit? Mm. Um, and that's about, you know, all the greening stuff, like the green loop that we've talked about. Can you find ways in which town centres can connect to each other more uh, pedestrian in a more pedestrian-friendly way so that you're less likely to use cars and public transport and so on? So it, it, it it's about 
taking some of that burden off the business individually and, and, and assuming it at a local level or a regional level, um, more local than regional, um, but also um, helping people understand the small things that they can do. But again, mm-hmm. back to my earlier point, if we couldn't persuade our board that this was a good idea, then they wouldn't allow us to spend the money doing it. You know? Yeah, yeah. So you have to spend time and energy getting the buy-in. I suppose we've, we've mentioned a few of your projects so far, but now would probably be a good time to maybe explain them a bit more in depth so people know what, what, what we mean when we say like the, the green loop and the high line, that kind of thing. You tell us a bit sure. about, and maybe tell us a bit about some stuff you've, you've delivered already as well. Sure. Well, the green loop is, is, a, is a real thing already. Um, so that's thinking about the town centres of Camden Town, Kings Cross and Euston and how they do or rather don't link to each other mm-hmm. particularly well. We spend a lot of time thinking about town centres or high streets, but not that much about um, the way in which they link to each other. So we're trying to find the natural existing routes that are off main roads that can be more greened in order to promote their use. So we've come up with this four mile circular route that connects those three town centres and Regent's Park. So you can spend time in this four metre circle um, connecting those town centres and also thinking about the way in which the communities around those town centres connect within those, connect to those town centres, um, which they often don't actually, particularly if you think of places like Camden Town, Kings Cross and Euston, they're quite um, international. Um, they don't necessarily see feel that connected to the local community. So mm. the more we can travel through and around those areas, the more those pathways open up, the more people start to perceive them as being important to them. And of course, in a pandemic, post-pandemic world, that locale thing is so important, you know, whether it's your 15-minute, 20 minute city, I don't know what, what but you know, <laughs> it matters much more that you when you do get outside that you can move around your area in a nice way i think that's a really good point because it's interesting one because i think often bids um are trying to like pull up struggling town centers you know trying to get economic activity happening where somewhere like camden regents park houston they're already like very successful and actually in you know in the case of camden like a world famous place that people will travel a very long way to come to um, so that must give you a much different, I suppose, remit. Sure, we're not. Yeah, we're not. We're not sort of fighting for footfall. Um, yeah, yeah. And, it, and it's an amazing phenomenon, actually. That you know, throughout. Well, once people have been allowed to go outside during the pandemic, the footfall in Camden Town has held up amazingly well. Yeah. And some of that, I think, is because it's an interesting place to do stuff outside. Mm. You know, it's just a fun place to walk around. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't feel like an indoor kind of experience. Um, but some of it, I think, is to your earlier point. It's just, it's got a reputation. It's got an international brand. It's just, it's a thing to do. It's a place to go to. Um, and, 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 and yeah, we definitely benefit from that. But it doesn't mean we don't also have to fight battles, you know, to get attention on certain issues with the local, author- you know, working with the local authority, the police, um, transport authorities. You know, you still got to do the same stuff that you would in any yeah. town centre. Everywhere has problems, I guess. They do. Um, and what about the High Line is obviously a very like high profile, not to, not to use a pun, but high profile, um, flashy, I suppose, kind of project. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Sure. I mean, what we're trying to do is reuse a bit of disused railway infrastructure. So if you've ever been on the North London Line, if you've ever been through Camden Road Overground Station, Mm. What you probably don't realize is next to you is another, or was once, another set of rails. So actually there was a whole other separate line that used to run uh, between Kentish Town Road in Camden Town and York Way um, uh, to the north of King's Cross. Mm. So what we're trying to do is take that dead space that's up in the sky and turn it into an amazing linear park so that as part of that green loop journey, you can mm. move between these town centres through nice, green, um, healthy environments. And what's also very interesting about the Highland is it goes through ca- four of Camden's most densely populated housing estates. Oh, and the, right. mayor of, the mayor of London has this aspiration that everyone should be within 400 metres of green space. And 10,000 people qualify for that the minute you open the Highline. Wow. Which is partly to do with the lack of green in those mm. areas. 
if you think of that bit sort of just to the north of king's cross and then you know as it is very flies urban. direct yeah and so there isn't that much green around there but also very densely populated so mm. you th- this tent this four, 400 meters green space thing uh, happens very quickly actually if you go to 500 meters it's something like 20,000 people, which is 8% of Camden's population. Wow. <laughs> so you don't think of it as a particularly dense, even that familiar an area, and yet it's got all those people in it. Um, so we're trying to sort of bring green to their doorsteps. Amazing. I mean, the, 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 yeah, it's just fantastic. Like the potential to improve people's daily lives with that. Just incredible. Yeah, well, I really. suppose, you know, thinking about New York, um, New York Highline has been, I suppose, a bit of a victim of its own success because it's been so popular. It's really, you know, some would say has gentrified the area around it and has made it maybe challenging to afford to live there for, you know, resi- normal residents and businesses. Yeah. Do, you, do you have any thoughts on sort of managing that? Well, it's interesting. We've talked a lot with um, the, the, the originators and the current people running the New York Highline. And, and I always ask them the same question. You know, if you were starting again now, what would you yeah what would you do differently they always say two things one is get the landowners to contribute early doors <laughs> because they're the biggest beneficiaries and yeah. they contributed the least uh and the second is build the community in from the start and i think we've we've really taken that to heart um we've spent a lot of time visiting small local groups 1500 people have been on walks we've got 300 friends of the high line we've taken a thousand donations via the website just tiny little amounts mm. um it's it's all really about just trying to get people to understand what this is and to feel that it's part of their world okay the other thing i think that's interesting that's different is um because so much of the land that the high line will go through is public mm. You know, the biggest beneficiary in terms of balance sheet is Camden Count is going to be Camden Council. Ah, right. But they can't realise that benefit in the way that a private landowner yeah. could. You know, if you own a house in Kentish Town, you're going to get some kind of uplift. But if you own those housing estates, it's much harder to realise that benefit. So I think that will be a natural kind of um uh, depressing factor on yeah. that gentrification part. But that's not to say that I think in a very positive way particularly the four feet, the places, the four places it's, it's going to land are all quite ignored. Mm. They're not particularly great places. If you think of the, the, the park at, 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 on, at Camden Gardens, it's, you know, it's quite disused. Okay. Um, if you think of Royal College Street um, around there under that railway bridge there, you know, again, it's not a particularly utilized space. Um, same at Camley Street, very disused, the place. It mm. And at York Way, it's the real dead zone, in a sense, between the really exciting tile yard and the really exciting Argent development at King's Cross. So I think I think some some of the um, some of the benefits will actually be really positive, and, 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 I, and I hope yeah. not too much along that line of taking things away from people. It'll actually be bringing them to local people. Brilliant, brilliant. So did you actually plan the entrance points? No. Or is that just a happy accident? <laughs> it's all it's all um, um, circumstantial. You, know, you, 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 you cut, that, that's the thing about this. We're not we're not building the garden bridge. You know, we're not building anything new. Yeah, it's all existing infrastructure. Ah, okay, that we're reusing as best we can. So yeah, no. If, I mean, someone was berating me a while ago, saying, "Why doesn't the High Line go through Somerstown?" Well. I, I can't move the viaduct. You know, it's like it's, <laughs> it's all it is what it is. You know, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, no. It, as it happens, those four feet are in quite sort of neglected areas, mm. um, uh, and that's just a, a, a nice benefit rather than something that was planned. Brilliant. Um, and you, I know you had it open to an open competition. We did. Have you secured a, a design team? We have. We have. We had mm. 75 entries from across the world. Yeah. It was a fantastic experience, actually, I have to say. Um, I wasn't on the, the, the jury um, that, that, that people who know about these things were, were, were the part of the jury. Um, but we, one of the teams had Brian Eno in it, and I'm still upset that <laughs> they didn't get shortlisted. Um, but um, that's, that's, you have to be of a certain age to appreciate that, I think. Yeah. Um, but, um, but I was upset that, that they didn't make the shortlist. But the winning team was James Corner and Field Operations, who did do the New York Highline. But okay. I think I think one of their key factors was the team they built around them. So Pete Aldoff is a sort of planting guru. Um, VPPR Architects, a really cute little practice based in Kentish Town. Um, so they just put together this absolutely spot on team. 
really really exciting i can't wait to follow that and and, mm. and see it and, I, and I, I back to your early early earlier sort of inquisition really i think i think the business improvement district has been so important to that mm. you know we've been able to move quite quickly mainly because we've got a paid staff right you know yes we've got a bank account and we have expertise you know the chair of the high line is a retired director from arab who was a former board member of the bid you know and there's lots of that happy stance happen happy happenstance <laughs> that's kind of helped us move at pace throughout yeah. this but i do think having you know resources and a paid professional staff really does help you move so much more quickly you know well i'm not going out fundraising for my salary yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. and so many voluntary organizations are struggling with that part of it which is why i do think that that using business improvement districts is something that we should think more about I think that's brilliant because I'm. I mean, I'm so interested in in the mechanisms and mm. the systems you put in place to actually make these things happen. Green infrastructure, climate action. It's often very difficult to find the money for it or to convince a developer to put the money towards it. Yeah. Um, so I think this is really exciting, and it's not something I've come across before. Is using yeah. a bid, um, and as you said, you sort of have all the right things built in. Um, the funding the staff, the the sort of democratic um, element to it. So yeah, I really hope people, everyone listening can sort of think about that and maybe think about, you know, if you're in, if you have any contact with your local bid, if you're in England or if you have a, some version of that internationally, um, yeah, it could be a real option in other places. I think so. I think so. I'm always happy to talk to people anyway. So if anyone wants to get in touch. There you go. You heard it. You heard it first here. <laughs> <laughs> Um, another thing I want to chat to you about was um, you have some uh, a green loop climate plan. Yeah, what's that about? Well, it's to our earlier discussion really that when you look at it was Camden Council actually you know they've been very good on the cold climate change agenda and they're looking at where the to dos are, mm. what the things are that need to change, and we can all get rather stuck on shit. We've got to change every <laughs> boiler in every house in you know in. <laughs> <laughs> yes. you know that feels hard um but if you sort of come down the list and start to look at some of the more doable things a lot of them are business related hmm. you know it's 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 just as hard if not harder for a business to think about changing its boiler particularly if in a, in a rented property um to, to to think about how it uses distribution um how it consolidates distribution perhaps in a last mile way um there are things that if if you can work across a, an area rather than put the responsibility on the individual business, yeah, you can try and do some of those things like like last mile delivery consolidation and so on and so forth. And you know, it's not just business improvement districts, although they are quite fundamental to another organisation called Cross River Partnership, um, that uh, run by the brilliant Susanna Wilkes, that brings together local authorities and business improvement districts to look at those sorts of things. And a lot of the stuff that's happened around there, around the green economy, is because they can do things across areas. They're mm. not constantly just nagging an individual business. You know, what are you going to do about your diesel van? You know, it's if we can provide find a common area where mm. an electric vehicle could be provided, could you think about using that for your last mile distribution, for example? So it's is that enabling, enabling factors. Exactly, exactly. And work and working at that sort of intermediate level, that you're not just relying on individuals or individual businesses, you're also not expecting government to solve everything, or even regional government, or even local government, because let's face it, they've all got a lot on their plates at the moment. Yeah. Um, so, you know, but can we do something in a locale that, that, that helps to sort of address that? And I think, you know, we've tried to do stuff around thinking, I mentioned earlier, thinking about the fourth industrial revolution. There is stuff coming at us like a train. Look at some of the stuff that DeepMind is solving for us. We don't even know how, you know. Um, <laughs> and, and, and whilst those bodies that we rely on, national, regional, local government, are so distracted with a lot of stuff that's really hard mm. uh, at the moment, um, and individual businesses are struggling, and anyway, what can they do on their own? That public-private space in which bids and others sit is, I think, a really interesting place to start trying to solve, to do, you know, to actually try and solve some things. Experiment and fail as well. Um, but but that's a, that's a space, I think, that we don't see 
very much. It's kind mm. of unseen. It happens below the radar. Um, and it's certainly the space that we try and operate in. I had um, a guest on the podcast about a year ago. Um, her name was Lisa Degter- Degtereva, um, Hungarian. And she was um, her whole focus is on helping small and medium in- enterprises um, mm-hmm. be, more, be more sustainable and adopt yeah. more you know, regenerative, sustainable practices. And she had some incredible statistic. There was something like more than 50% of all um, uh, carbon emissions are related to small and medium enterprises yeah they're not yeah. you know not not the we always think of amazon and the big you know the really big companies and obviously they do have huge footprints but collectively all the millions of smes around the world have a huge footprint as well and they're the ones that are least able to to maybe make the changes personally exactly you know? right exactly right you know it's that long tail and in london i think it represents half of all private sector employment wow the sme sector you know you know, you think of all those people that are working in these businesses, but the individual businesses are often really struggling. Yeah. And turning up at their door and saying, uh, can you just sort this out as well? Feels too much. It's, you know, yeah, it's easy yeah. for Amazon, you know, they, as a diktat from above and, and they basically have to get on with it. Um, for SMEs, it's much, much harder. And I've certainly spent time using European money. Mm. He pauses for a small weep there. Um, <laughs> But yeah, in the past, uh, past yes, tense. indeed, indeed, indeed. In fact, I chaired a group at the GLA that that distributed, you know, all this terrible European money that we were fortunately <laughs> relieved from having to spend. Um, but um, you know, that the, the, trying to use that money to get small businesses to improve their carbon footprint is a lot of work. Mm. It's an awful lot of shoe leather, just getting <laughs> someone's attention, and actually, people underinvest in the time it takes to do that work, to engage with mm. local individual businesses. It's hard, hard stuff. So it's always much easier and you get more res- quicker results and bigger results, just nagging Amazon. <laughs> um, you mentioned the fourth industrial revolution twice. It is a term yes. that I've only recently uh, only recently heard. Yeah. Uh, you tell us what that is and why. Yeah, you're, I was going to say, you're going to ask me to explain it. Yeah, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> well, it's all, it's all the stuff that we can't control, basically. The... the, the <laughs> You know, you know, we've been using big data sources and increasingly some of these, um, ext- you know, look at what Facebook does with its algorithms. Look at what um, uh, uh, DeepMind's been doing in the sort of biotech world. You know, it, that stuff is huge, exciting and quite scary. Mm. And it's going to affect the way we do so many things. Think of driverless cars. Think of, you know, um, driverless cars is, is such a good easy one we don't talk about driverless cars anymore do you remember a few years ago that's all anyone talked about yeah. you know every time you get in an uber you you'd say to the driver yeah you're going to be obsolete soon you know um i didn't say that but you know you used to think it <laughs> <laughs> and now Still no one talk happened. yeah yeah no indeed um but that's you know the technology is like that isn't it everyone over eulogizes about it in the first mm. two years says nothing about it for the next five or six and then suddenly it's happened you know yeah um uh, I, I'm, I think that's Bill Gates said that. That's not an original thought. Um, <laughs> but, um, y- you know, all that stuff is starting to happen and we're not really paying it much attention. So again, can we, with our weird democratic legitimacy and a bit of time and hopefully a bit of intelligence and some money, spend time thinking about how we might be able to utilize this stuff? And And we had a sort of project we ran for a while that looked at, you know, could you have real-time licensing? So could you, for example, allow a venue, you can't because the law doesn't allow you, but you know, you could think about the idea, but could you allow a venue to stay open half an hour later if it didn't trigger any noise sensors in a particular area? Uh, And that would be a real time kind of licensing setup, you know, Mm. and, you know, provided the residents who don't like the noise kind of bought into the level and, you know, but those sorts of things are very hard to think about at a national, regional, or even local government level. But we can, so those those are the sorts of things. Also, you know, uh, so much around local areas, if you think of the way local government planning happens, it's generally heavily influenced by six retired architects and a retired planner. <laughs> you know, it is, you know, and they all have peculiar ideas about what they like. And now they've got loads of time and spent a lot of their life frustrated by other retired architects who wouldn't <laughs> let them build the buildings they want. You know, you could just see it going on all the time. Yeah. Now there's a silent majority of people who have potentially quite different ideas 
about what the built environment around them should look like, could be used for, how they'd like to. But they don't have the interest, time, expertise, mm. you know, narrow-minded focus and obsession that all these retired architects have. Sorry, retired architects, but you are <laughs> you are a strange bunch. Um, <laughs> um, sorry, I've just pissed off half your your podcast. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, y- y- you know, could could we think about? you know, more light touch ways of engaging that broader silent majority so that we're not so skewed by a, a mm. smaller group of, uh, of ideas. So th- those are the sorts of things that we, we, we try to think about. It's not just about driverless, car- driverless cars and deep mining. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I suppose in one, in one sense, I'm always sceptical of the idea of technology coming along and saving us from you know, climate catastrophe, because mm. it just seems like, really, we're going to put our, our bets on that, on something that hasn't been done yet. We don't know when it's, you know, really going to be delivered. But as you said, these things are happening. They're sort of beyond our our control. People are working well, on them. The, the, the thing that scares me about it is not that technology um, won't solve it. I suspect it, it probably will. The danger is it's a technology that's AI driven that hasn't yeah. been given the right directive. You know, if you if you give a very clever and and all powerful AI the the directive to sort out climate change, it will. But we might not survive. You know, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> um, those are the things I, I actually worry about a little bit more. But um, that's the, the, that's yeah. way beyond our pay grade or podcast. <laughs> I think you know you're right though because I think I mean that sounds. Sometimes these things come up on the podcast, and I always yeah. say to people like, "This sounds outlandish," but yeah. there are genuinely a lot of people much smarter than me who are very worried about it and we should yeah. take their yeah. worries seriously because yeah, really. we don't know these things until you know these kind of technologies always hit an inflection point where they become exponential exactly. and it'll it'll happen before we know it just like smartphones and constantly being hooked into social media got us before we even realized it was happening and only exactly. now a couple of years later we're realizing how damaging yeah. it is yeah yeah. And, I, you know, I was reading at the weekend, you know, DeepMind is solving problems really, really well. No one knows how. Oh, my God. <laughs> we don't we can't see its work. It's like a mathematician who doesn't show you they're working, you know. <laughs> Brilliant. It's amazing. But ooh, it's a little bit scary, too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Mm. Uh, <laughs> interesting. Interesting. Sorry, um, we've taken you off all kinds of places we didn't intend to go. No, Should we go back to greenery in the local environment? It's good, it's good. I mean, it's just, you know, these are the kind of things that, that you know, we do need to think about. Cool. Should have someone to talk about AI on the podcast, actually. I haven't really thought of that. There's, um, a, there's, a, uh, there's, a, there's a blog by, uh, called Wait But Why. If, if you've come Wait is, But is Why. Wait But Why. Okay. Um, and I can't remember the name of the guy behind it, but, but he's, he's very good at all this sort of stuff. Can I ask a bit about where you've come from and why are you so interested in in climate change and, and urban greening? Um, so my ba- I started life as a musician, would you believe? Oh, uh, ah, really? You know, playing in bands in Camden, yeah, when I was uh, yeah, like a very young man. Um, so Camden's always sort of been around, you know. Uh, and then I ended up d- uh, working in politics. I okay. was sort of, um, you know, connected with this whole new Labour stuff. I worked for the Labour Party in that, that era. Uh, did a bit of work in the city and started business, ran my own businesses. So there's a kind of coming together of that sort of politics and business that sits very well with what I do on a day to day basis, really. Um, mm. You know, I would describe it's a bit of a dirty word, but I think my job is mainly about lobbying. You know, <laughs> here's a great idea. Should we do it? Yeah. How can I help you see that and unlock the blocks to it? And, you know, so much of what we do on a day-to-day basis is about that really lobbying for good things i suppose yeah, hopefully <laughs> yeah yeah but also understanding it from a business perspective because i think you know that's that's quite important too we off it's quite easy i think to say this is a good thing to do and to think the yeah. business will think it's a bad thing because it's not you know the evil sort of profit motive but actually <laughs> businesses provide all these jobs they provide all the taxes you know it's a really important part of the economy and we need to kind of see them integrated and as a whole i quite often say because you know sometimes people local people in camden will complain about what businesses are up to i often say you know businesses are part of the community too mm. but we think about it differently so you don't feel the same way about where you work as where you live yeah you know if the bins don't get emptied outside your house you notice like you know that night if they don't get emptied outside your workplace yeah, it's someone else's thing to worry about. Yeah. I've got other things. It's so you you care to a different degree. Doesn't mean you don't care, but 
but it's different. And that's often the cause of tension because the resident community expects someone who works there to have the same level of care that they do. Mm. Uh, and it doesn't mean that the person, that, that worker doesn't care that to that much where they live, you know. But they, they are different. And I think we can acknowledge those differences and work with them rather than kind of trying to force them to be the same. Um, and that's often where I think where the tension comes. But it's it's all it's all workable with, provided you're working with people who can kind of step back a bit and see that. Mm. Do you, do you struggle to um, make climate change relevant for businesses, or sometimes? Yeah, definitely. yeah, because it's not now, and yeah. so much of business, and particularly at the moment, you know. Imagine you're in the hospitality game at the moment. You know, oh, yeah. You know, can I, can, will my takings give me enough to pay my staff tonight? You know, that's, that's what keeps you awake at night. Um, and so something that's, you know, even the high line that's, you know, maybe three or four years away is for a lot of people is just, ugh, you know, will I even be here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so, so of course it's hard for businesses to think like that. Bigger businesses have invested in people who do that thinking for them. Sure. Small businesses, you know, it's normally one person who's having to do all the thinking about everything. Yes, yeah. You know, and that's hard. Do you, do you, how do you sort of win them around, I suppose, when you're trying to get support for these initiatives? Well, sometimes, sometimes you, you can't. That's a, that's a democracy, you know. You, you mm. know not everyone will, will buy into the idea. Um, I mean, generally, we've got a very good board. So they're people who are, brought in enough to the process of running a bid and there we are quite good at having disagreements okay yeah. so we tend not to have shouty rows and <laughs> you know it tends to be a sort of discussion yeah a, a grown-up discussion um and 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 that can help sort of bring people around or at least people say well i don't agree but i'm i've bought into the process i've got a collective responsibility thing here so i'll accept that um and, and and also what we're saying to, to people to some extent is, you know, I understand you can't worry about this, but we can worry about it for you. Yeah. And part of supporting us is relieving you of that burden to some extent. That's a really good way of thinking about it, actually. Hmm. Um, I'm kind of, we've kind of blistered through everything at a, at a record pace. Um, which I'm very grateful for, but we do have a bit of a bit of time. If you wanted to bring up anything before I move on to the final question, um, um, any sort of message you want us to give out to the uh, the audience, or any other stuff you're working on that would be worth. Talking I think. About? I think. Well, the the, the two things are that. Well, one one thing that I just think generally, which is business improvement districts can be really good. They just need more help to think like that, and I think I've made that point. The other is a very London centric thing, but it does partly because of my work with the mayor, it does really um, worry me at the moment is the way in which we're dealing with Transport for London. Ooh. You know, you know it, it, it is, it's so vital to the UK economy and it's caught in this levelling up agenda um, and perhaps a bit of a spat between the mayor and the prime minister. But, you know, if, we, if your capital city can't have a high-functioning public transport system the ramifications of that are quite great yeah and it and i worry that it's being used as a political football i I think we're probably outside the scope of your podcast here but you know that's that does really worry me at the moment yeah i mean i think i think a lot of listeners who are familiar with uk politics would probably agree with you on that you know and it does seem quite worrying that you know transport i think it's actually the case in in many places around i mean many cities around the country don't have their own uh don't have control over their own public transport they're reliant on private sector delivering you know bus routes and that kind of thing and it seems like tfl is being made to run like a private enterprise when it's actually fulfilling a public function Mm. um and i do i suppose i do worry about you know transport is an enabling it's like we said earlier it's an enabling thing it allows people to get to work on time it allows people to have access to, to opportunities. Hmm. Um, and I suppose... It, it enables us to travel in a more green fashion as well. You know? Exactly as well. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, I, and I think I, what I would say is I think what's to me is important is not to get fixated on the, on, on the, the, the mechanism. So mm. actually, 
if it can be run well as a privately operated company and everyone gets to work on time in a green field, mm-hmm. that's still fine. You know, Absolutely, we mustn't yeah. become obsessed with you, it mustn't be this or it mustn't be that. What matters is that it works. Yeah. Um, and I think that pragmatic um, uh, mindset is really important. I mean, you know, if we're getting into politics, you know, the left needs to get over its obsession with business is bad and the right needs to get over its obsession with the public sector is bad. You know, what matters is what's the outcome? How do we make this work? Um and I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that's quite the problem with TfL. I think it's 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 literally mm. being used as a stick to beat up the mayor and got stuck in the treacle of this London is bad leveling up stuff that's going mm. on and affecting our politics or you know at all levels at the moment. Um, you know the the the, the end, it, particularly in a country like Britain where London is so dominant, there yeah. are very I can't think of another country in the world where one city matters so much more to the economy than all the others you know right it's not true of germany or france or america it's you know and and so we are whatever the you know we are stuck with what we've got in terms of london and the uk so stopping seeing london as a separate entity and as part you know in a sense all of the uk is greater london sorry i've probably just upset another <laughs> half of your listeners there but you know what i mean to stop seeing it as a separate thing it's we all have connections to London and we need to see it as something that needs to function for the benefit of us all, not something that needs to be leveled down so mm. that other people can take an imaginary space that doesn't exist. That's so true, isn't it? I mean, even after the um, the Brexit referendum, there was people calling for London to become a kind of <laughs> an enclave that rejoins the EU. It's just like, oh, it, it does feel like two different countries, really, sometimes. Mm. Yeah, yeah. No, integration is very important, I think. Anyway, sorry, we went way off topic there. <laughs> you had a, you had a, you had a killer last question for me. Go for it. I did the same question I ask all guests. So obviously, we're in a, a pivotal moment for taking action on climate change, and the next decade I think will be really crucial. So, what, from your perspective, what would you like to see happen or change in the coming decade, um, so that we can, I suppose, be successful with our climate action and whatever success means to you? Yeah, that is a killer question. I don't know, is the honest <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, you know, from my perspective, it's about fixing the things you can fix. Mm. Um, and I think this, you know, what is the silver bullet killer answer is sometimes too distracting. Right. I think fix the things you can fix, touch the things you can touch, do the things you can do. Um, and, you know, if we all do that, I think we'll get closer to a solution than if we either point fingers at other people telling them to do or hang back and wait for someone to find the silver bullet um then i think we 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 we, the risk there is greater than if we just put our heads down take responsibility and do yeah i heard i heard a great quote recently which is that there's no silver bullet but there is silver buckshot in the sense that there's lots (laughs) of little things we have to do yeah um so you know i think part of my ongoing journey is finding and i'm sure for a lot of the listeners as well is finding the thing that we personally feel like we can do and have yeah. a, you know an, a, a very strong impact on but yeah. letting go of that feeling like we have to fix everything because nobody exactly. can fix everything you know? exactly right yeah yeah excellent thank you very much um is there anywhere online people can learn more about you and the work you're doing Sure. Um, CamdenTownUnlimited.com is probably the best starting point. Um, and obviously you can find me on LinkedIn and see all the other things there or Twitter or so on. Yeah, at Pitt Keithley is probably the best place to start. Okay, cool. Well, I'll, put, I'll put that in the episode description as well so people can find that. Um, thank you so much for joining me. It's been a pleasure. 